Welcome to this webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. This is on a subject which isn't routinely talked about if at all. So it's great for us to know that you're interested in this subject and we're looking forward to um, giving our presentations and then having a, a Q&A session based on your comments and questions. Um, now, one of the reasons why we decided to put on this webinar is because we think literature in the broadest sense and narratives um, can be a very useful tool and it can help us understand human behavior and the reluctance or, or ways in which we can um, help uh, us move towards a clean energy future um, where sometimes bare science, uh, sorry, bare facts and science have just not been able to do that. Um, now I'm going to be recording this session um, so that uh, we can make the video available afterwards, but fear not, you will not be featured, featured in the video. Um, but it will be, um, a, we will be making a video of the, of the presentations and the Q&A so that we can make it available to people after the event. Okay, so I'm going to crack on and introduce our speakers now. So first of all, I'd like to introduce David Aberbach. Now, David is a uh, visiting professor at the University of Oxford uh, at the moment, while also a professor of Hebrew and Comparative Studies at M McGill University. He specializes in literature and social sciences and teaches courses in these areas at McGill. <laughs> and he's written numerous books, of which his latest is entitled Literature and Poverty from the Hebrew Bible to Modern Times. So that will be David. Myself, I am Helen Gavin, and I'm based in the Environmental Change Institute of the University of Oxford. I'm currently working on the programme of integrating renewable energy, where we look to see what the barriers are to the further integration of renewable technologies and try and find solutions for them. I describe myself as a sustainability, sustainability professional, and I've got expertise in water and renewable energy issues. And our third speaker will be Antonella Mazzoni, um, and, she <laughs> and she works on the role of gender and local cultures in understanding energy practices and energy consumption at the individual and household level. And she has a PhD where she explored the impacts of energy access on local productive activities, health and gender relations in ethno-cultural communities in the Brazilian Amazon. Now Antonella is currently working on the um, an Oxford Martin program on the future of cooling um, and where she's investigating interplays between culture, identity and social relations in cooling energy household practices. Okay, so I'm very pleased to be joined by David Antonello for this event. Um, for those people who have just joined, let me just, uh, just say uh, we would like to see you. So please put on your video if you wish, if you have the internet broadband. Um, you cannot speak, you cannot mute yourself. So please, if you have comments and questions, put them into the chat pane so we can pick them up. So let us move on to our presentations. So David, can I ask you to start us off, please? Thank you, Helen. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about literary views on moral dilemmas in the uses of energy. Um, and I'll start with reference to a letter of Albert Einstein you may have heard of, written in 1939 to the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, in which he warned the President that the splitting of the atom generated vast amounts of power which could lead to extremely powerful bombs, as he put it. <clears throat> in the hands of the Nazis, this power would undoubtedly be used for evil purposes, and it was vital, Einstein wrote, that America and the free world prevented this. The fear of what human beings will do with energy is felt in some of the most ancient literature that has come down to us, in Greek mythology and in the Hebrew Bible. The Greek gods, knowing that fire is destructive, do not allow humankind the use of fire. Yet fire also creates civilization, agriculture and progress, the arts and sciences. And so Prometheus, in an act of daring for which he is grievously punished, steals fire from the forge of Hephaestus, blacksmith of the gods, and gives it to human beings. The Bible, too, is uneasy with the, use, with the uses of fire and iron technology. In the character of Cain, 
murder and metalwork are joined. Cain kills his brother Abel and becomes the world's first murderer. And Cain's son, Tubal Cain, becomes the first smith working with iron. As in Greek myth, the smith has an ambivalent role. He makes agricultural tools for peaceful purposes, but he also makes weapons for war and destruction. These stories communicate a universal feeling that energy is part of the age-old battle between good and evil, and this is a central and consistent theme in literature, particularly since the Industrial Revolution. Many writers have written about moral dilemmas created by modern technology. Among them are Wordsworth, Goethe, Dickens, Mary Shelley, Elizabeth Gaskell, Emil Zola, Henrik Ibsen, Joseph Conrad, Anton Chekhov, and John Steinbeck. I hope we'll speak more about these writers in future, but today, Helen Antonella and I will be trying to get a discussion going on how science and the arts have in their different ways, common concerns with the environment and the uses and abuses of energy. I'll try to get the discussion started by talking briefly about two famous texts, John Milton's Paradise Lost and William Blake's poem, The Tiger. In both, energy is a force of creativity and destruction. It is admired and feared. Both are poems written in times of revolution when kings were deposed. Milton, during and after the English Civil War in the mid 17th century, Blake at the time of the French Revolution in the early 1790s. Here is Milton's description of the fallen angels defeated in their revolt against heaven and cast down into a world of darkness and emptiness. Imagine a world without electricity. Inspired by Satan, the devils draw upon their power, creativity and enterprise to build a magnificent city, pandemonium, but they build on volcanic land, dangerously unstable. They are compared to an invading army, destroying, looting, and raping the earth. There stood a hill not far, whose grisly top belched fire and rolling smoke. The rest entire shone with a glossy skirt, undoubted sign that in his womb was hid metallic ore, the work of sulphur. Thither winged with speed a numerous brigade hastened, as when bands of pioneers with spade and pickaxe armed forerun the royal camp to trench a field or cast a rampart. Mammon led them on, Mammon, the least erected spirit that fell from heaven. For even in heaven his looks and thoughts were always downward bent, admiring more the riches of heaven's pavement, trodden gold than aught divine or holy else enjoyed in vision beatific. By him first, men also, and by his suggestion taught, ransacked the center, and with impious hands rifled the bowels of their mother earth. The treasures better hid, Soon had his crew opened into the hill a spacious wound and digged out ribs of gold. Let none admire that riches grow in hell, that soil may best deserve the precious bane. And here let those who boast in mortal things and wondering tell of Babel and the works of Memphian kings learn how their greatest monuments of fame and strength and art are easily outdone by spirits reprobate. And in an hour, what in an age they with incessant toil and hands innumerable scarce perform. Nigh on the plain in many cells prepared that underneath had veins of liquid fire sluiced from the lake a second multitude with wondrous art founded the massy ore, severing each kind and scummed the bullion dross. A third as soon had formed within the ground a various mould, and from the boiling cells by strange conveyance filled each hollow nook as in an organ, from one blast of wind to many a row of pipes, the soundboard breeze anon out of the earth 
a fabric huge, rose like an exhalation, with a sound of dulcet symphonies and voices sweet, built like a temple where pilasters round were set and Doric pillars overlaid with golden architrave, nor did there want cornice or frieze with bossy sculptures graven, the roof was fretted gold. When the arched roof pendant by subtle magic, many a row of starry lamps and blazing crescents fed with naphtha and asphaltus yielded light as from the sky. Well, you can see how the devils have switched the electricity on. In this temple of evil, the devils decide to send Satan to destroy human life in the Garden of Eden and bring death into the world. So I'd like you to consider this passage in the context of the energy and enterprise needed in human advancement. Are these things in invariably alloyed with wrongdoing? The metals dug by the devils led by mammon from the fiery pit of hell are precious bane, precious, but also a cause of suffering. Precious bane is an oxymoron, which we might use to describe mining generally. Many metals are indeed precious, but they come with a cost of labor exploitation and environmental damage. Milton wrote Paradise Lost after the Civil War in the 1640s, in which he had served in the revolutionary Cromwell government. And in his poem, he clearly admires the devil's courage to revolt and their defiance in defeat. They show extraordinary ability to harness energy. They are efficient as bees rapidly building an entire city, a creative masterpiece, well-ordered, functional and aesthetic not inferior to the Pantheon on the Acropolis, the most admired building in Milton's time. Pandemonium, all the devils, is the inverse of the Pantheon, all the gods, but no less accomplished and no less beautiful. The architect, Hephaestus, is an expert in metalwork requiring fire. He is renowned in heaven too, by many a towered structure high where scepter angels held their residence. The architect of hell is the architect of heaven. This is the same blacksmith from whom Prometheus stole fire to give to human beings. The blacksmith of the gods becomes the blacksmith of hell. And a man too can build for heaven or for hell, and the mind of man, Milton writes, can make a hell of heaven and a heaven of hell. Milton's portrayal of the courageous, enterprising, satanic rebel, despite his moral condemnation and mockery of the devils, led William Blake to comment on his poem, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, the reason Milton wrote in fetters when he wrote of angels and God, and at liberty when of devils and hell, is because he was a true poet, and of the devil's party without knowing it. Blake, writing at the time of the French Revolution, is thinking of Milton too in aphorisms such as the tigers of wrath are wiser than the horses of instruction, and energy is eternal delight. The energy and enterprise of the devils in paradise lost are necessary in human creativity, in politics, industry, and the art. Evil is a source of creativity, and out of evil good can come. This is the central theme in Paradise Lost. Creative energy involves inward contradiction of innocent meekness and Promethean daring. The conflict is put memorably in the poem The Tiger, which Blake wrote during the French Revolution in the early 1790s. Again, a king was deposed and executed, and the revolutionary government seized the fire and brought terror. But Blake has in mind not just the French Revolution, but also the explosive, apocalyptic force of the Industrial Revolution. Its new forms of harnessing and exploiting nature as an age-old expression of energy, sin, enterprise, and creativity. To Blake, the Industrial Revolution is evil and good inseparable. 
the dark satanic mill springing up in bursts of energy and enterprise. Here is the poem, which you can follow on Blake's engraving, which he did for the original publication in 1794. Try to imagine the furnace of Hephaestus and Prometheus seizing the fire to bring it to humankind. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burned the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp? Dare its deadly terrors clasp. When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? In this hammer blow series, of Promethean questions, Blake creates a feeling that as in the book of Job, there are no clear answers. Nature can never be entirely controlled and tamed. The energy unleashed by the Industrial Revolution was awesome and dangerous, and it could not be otherwise. To, to both Blake and Milton, evil is a catalyst of creativity. Milton and Blake compress in a nutshell some very large issues, particularly the way literature identifies moral dilemmas in the uses of energy. So we'll now go to Helen for ways in which the poetry and the science can shed light on one another. Thank you very much, David. I'm not sure I'm going to be shedding much light, <laughs> I have to say, but what I will be doing is to introduce um, what energy we have been using as a world, as a world society over time. Can I just ask those people who have recently joined us um, to pop any questions or comments you might have in the chat pane and we'll pick those up. I'm going to speak for a few minutes on um, Oh, kind of more of a scientific vent on energy and um, then Antonello will pick up the thread of literature again and then we will address your questions. I hope you're enjoying it so far. Okay, here's a picture of the sun from NASA. Uh, we have a lot to thank the sun for. I would like to make the case that energy is a very good thing and we cannot live without energy. The positives are phenomenal. With energy, we have been able to keep ourselves warm. We've created food. Uh, we've been able to create machinery. And with that machinery has, has enabled us to advance massively in terms of science and technology. Um, it's improved our health outcomes. We've been able to travel the world through um, available energy and that's led to an enriched cultural life and connection with lots of people around the world. It's boosted the economy and given us a higher standard of living. Energy is a good thing. If we look over time, as this chart is showing us from 1800s, it shows the composition of where we've got our energy from across the world. First of all, the, the, the obvious thing is how much our energy use has increased over time. And then we can see how it's changed. So for a very long time, um, uh, up to about the 1850s, we were using traditional biofuels. What this means is wood, plants, animals, using animals for transport and for work, using oxen for plough, etc. Um, we would consume these biofuels to, um, to keep us warm, to build uh, houses and construction. And then, and around the 1850s or earlier, we started using coal. And coal transformed how we could use energy and how we could use energy to lift ourselves uh, to greater ambitions. Coal is a densely packed, portable form of energy. It allows us to raise temperatures and create steam and it has underpinned the industrial revolution. Um, and coal is still a major form of, of energy around the world. Um, then we discovered crude oil and oil um, in the early days which found under pressure would literally just pop out of the ground. So it really brought down the cost of energy and it made energy uh, available to very uh, many more people. We're also able to use oil for lots of other things as well and we were able to derive things from oil such as synthetics, plastics, 
chemicals which led to fertilizers and, and enabled us to, to become ever more ambitious in what we would like to achieve. Um, with the discovery and use of oil, uh, um, was accompanied by natural gas for a lot of time. It's just flared, it's not really used, but we have harnessed it to keep ourselves warm. Um, and then you can see in the right at the end of the chart, um, you can see this uh, increasing um, amount of energy we're deriving from renewable sources. Uh, but you can see from this chart how much energy we get from fossil fuel sources. I just want to look in a bit more detail in the case of Britain. Um, so here, we, this chart is looking at our, our energy composition from the 1920s to present day, uh, with the kind of proportion of what of that energy source to our total usage. And you can see coal is king. We've been using coal for a very long time. Um, very, very recently, the UK has been without coal for an unprecedented record amount of time. But we have now started using it again a little bit. You can see how um, there was an interplay between our use of oil and coal, um, which was triggered by um, global crises, the oil crises, and also power plays. And we can talk about energy producing power, but in this sense, the power, uh, power for authority struggles between the miners and the government um, led to the dash for gas, and we are using gas um, considerably in the UK for heating and cooking purposes. Um, there's a line shown um, where 2020, 2010, the year 2010 to 2020, just to accentuate the last 10 years have been phenomenal in terms of how we have changed our energy sources in the UK and many more renewable sources have come online to the point where in 2019, Renewables formed more than half of our electricity supply, a trend which is continuing, which is a really positive, really positive thing because, because <laughs> if we want to tackle climate change, we need to tackle energy. Energy is the dominant contributor to climate change. So yes, indeed, it has this dual nature. It is, it is good on so many levels, but it has this other side to it, which um, our profligate use of energy has shown has resulted in record levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we know that our climate is changing, we're having a disruption to our uh, the air circulation and sea circulation uh, regimes. Here is a chart showing uh, temperature anomalies for, for last month, May 2020, and it's shown as a difference against a reference period um, and you can see the very dark red and dark blue spots across the world. I want to draw your attention to the very dark red spots in the Arctic over Siberia because I'll just be mentioning that in a moment. Um, so we know that this disruption is having adverse impacts, setting up a whole series of negative feedback loops. Can we tame this tiger to, to borrow <laughs> from what David <laughs> mentioned earlier? Um, <laughs> In addition to these impacts, there are so many other adverse impacts or evils, can we say, brought um, across environmental, health, social, cultural aspects. Here are just some pictures that illustrate what I mean. I could have chosen, there were so many examples I could choose from, but energy is a force for good, but it's a force for evil in the form of war, either enabling war to take um, to happen, such as atomic weapons, to going to war for energy resources. We talked about, David talked about mining and how that is a, a moral dilemma in here. Your child labor still exists here as a child um, miner in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, where many of the world's cobalt mines are located, an essential um, ingredient for many of our infrastructure projects, including renewable energy. Our use of energy for transport has led to smogs, which lead to health, adverse health um, uh, effects because of the poor air quality it results. We've experienced acid rain. We keep the lights on. Light pollution at night is a, is a critical aspect, which doesn't get the attention it deserves and is disrupting ecosystem and wildlife um, patterns. Um, freak storms not only devastate coastal communities, they bring up and wash up lots of plastics, which is plastic is again an amazing source that humanity possibly couldn't, I would argue, possibly could not cope without and yet it has phenomenal problems and creates devastating um, issues. Um, and then at the bottom, the Red River you can see is a diesel spill that happened in Russia very recently. Ironically, 
the storage container um, of this diesel became unsound because the permafrost underneath it had melted. Yeah. And then we also have situations such as the Junkan Gorge uh, in Australia, which um, a site sacred to Aboriginal communities there, which have, has been destroyed by mining activity. And again, we have the ongoing um, new and existing coal mines that are in existence today. So I'd say that the words of uh, commentators from the Industrial Revolution still have, could have a lot to say today. What can we do about it? The, Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change have laid out what we could do in terms of bringing down our emissions to meet certain average temperature increases. And the Paris Agreement was uh, well beating in terms of the number of countries signing up to this, but I would argue that progress has been so slow. It's one thing to sign up to a pledge and very different to act upon it. And yet we have seen the world can move quickly the coronavirus pandemic has shown us what could happen. It's not happening for climate change. It's not happening in terms of our energy sources. Why? Some good news that the, the arguments are coming through. And one of the ways in which this has helped is the decreasing cost of renewables. Just like oil, the, the use of oil was greatly enhanced because it was cheap. So renewables are just dropping in price and price and price. And this chart shows the increasing uh, amount of renewables in the global energy expansion, such that uh, the red line in 2019 shows that over 70% of all new energy infrastructure was renewable. But that grey bar um, for 2019 also shows that there are still fossil fuel power uh, plants being constructed. And this is a concern because they will last for 50, 60 years um, and continue the problems that we're seeing today. So what can we do? First is to reduce our energy use. The second is to continue to, to implement renewables. And another, another good sign is that science and technology are helping us again off the coast of England, um, one of the largest uh, wind farms is currently being constructed and will be operational from 2023. The turbines are huge. Here's one just showing you the scale against the Eiffel Tower and the Chrysler building. And each one is very powerful and it can um, produce enough electricity to power about 16,000 houses. So the future is bright. We are on the right track. I would argue we're not making enough progress um, because electricity is one thing. But if you recall back from the chart I showed before, um, there is still a large amount of fossil fuels being used. Um, one of the ways uh, that fossil fuels are still being used is via transport. And again, just as trying to help us see what could be the future, here are some pictures of traditional forms of transport, but they are all electrified, or they could run on hydrogen, they could run on green ammonia, there are other sources uh, that are possible. And the one exception there is the the cargo ship which has been fitted with sails so it's a hybrid between trying to harness what the wind's energy to reduce the amount of fuel that it consumes i want to end before passing on to antonella by saying that energy is a good thing and we should not, i think it is moral morally right to extend the benefits that we have experienced and enjoyed from energy to everybody in the world there are um millions of people in the world who do not have access at all to electricity. There are hundreds of millions more who do not have access to reliable electricity. Billions do not have access to clean cooking um, fuels and so die from health, um, die early from because of health issues and indoor air quality. This is morally wrong. So um, here we have the sustainable development goals of which number seven is uh, access to electricity for all by 2030. Underneath all of these sustainable development goals are many other goals, and it's, it's um, two thirds of them are all underpinned by affordable energy. So we must make more strides. And if bare facts and science are not convincing people, then we must choose, we must uh, opt for all technologies that we have. So I'm going to pass on to Antonella now, <laughs> and then. Um, after Antonella has spoken, we will have the Q&A session. So please pop your questions and comments into the chat pane and we'll pick up them soon. But Antonella. Okay, thank you, Alan. Thank you for your brilliant presentation. 
uh, we certainly cannot agree more on the fact that energy is fundamental today to deliver safe vaccines, guarantee food conservation and sustainable livelihood, especially in those areas which are currently lacking uh, sustainable energy. And this is the rationale behind the uh, Sustainable Goal number 7 and Agenda 2030. Uh, however, and I uh, link with David on the ambivalence of energy, uh, also behind this rationale and also behind all the good intents also of the sustainable energy for all um, agenda, there are some hidden, um, th there is an ambivalent part, there is a negative part embedded to it. And this is particularly true when, for example, we uh, need to bring electricity and we do it at the expense of uh, the local communities. I'm thinking about hydropower plants uh, built in the middle of the Amazon, for example, or the way that normally engineers approach local communities. And they do it in a way that, uh, yes, we are good because we bring you the technology, but they do it without consulting the local cultural system. And so in this sense, yes, uh, energy can be a, a powerful enabler and it's very much needed. However, if you do it without consultation of the local people, if you do it without the worldview, uh, understanding their worldview, I think it can cause some damage and uh, some of them are ir irreparable. We can have some examples, as I mentioned, uh, like the other power plant, but also in terms of technology adoption. When you, when you, you mentioned clean cooking uh, for all, right? Right. Um, and this is very much a, a gendered issue as well, because women are uh, the, the responsible for that. Uh, however, uh, it, we, we have now evidence that despite this global effort to bring clean cooking everywhere in the world, uh, this technology is either accepted temporary and then temporarily and then um, dismissed uh, and or, or, or can cause some gender relationship issues in terms of um, when you bring a change that will cause some conflict even in 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 the private sphere so we have some evidence of that and uh, people tend to adopt initially this technology and then leave it behind uh, because of either financial reason or also like social and cultural reasons so my job here is to bring my expertise to understand the cultural side of um, this this not only technology acceptance, but also how can we bring the worldview of indigenous people in this case, but also like in, also in other cases, uh, uh, into the discussion on how can we build some of, uh, uh, how can we bring their worldview in the energy systems. So I am uh, bringing uh, a piece of uh, most recent research that I recently submitted. So I'm gonna kindly ask the public to not take any screenshot, but <laughs> screenshot about this because it's still unpublished. Um, and I ask uh, in this, in this uh, particular new research, I ask uh, a fundamental question, what can we learn from uh, alternative worldviews and you know, how they see energy, how they interact with energy and nature. Uh, how literature leads the way to understand the social acceptability of certain energy systems because literature is a product of a culture and often reflects their worldview and I'm very interested to see their worldview through literature and oral stories. So I'm now going to introduce like a few slides on uh, um, a myth, uh, an, an indigenous uh, oral story uh, that has been uh, written down uh, um, and uh, it was made available, thank thankfully. Uh, and I uh, made some drawings of this uh, uh, oral story. Um, the hero is uh, is Kanasa, and uh, he's the leader of the Kuikuros tribe of the Alto Solimões um, in the Brazilian Amazon. And uh, he um, he attempts to steal the fire, um, <laughs> just as Prometheus. So we find some correlations here, although. Uh, the, the, this myth probably happened at two different times in history and in two different continents, but uh, um, it, it's, it's very similar in that sense. So um, I'm going to, to share the screen and uh, show you the slides. Uh, here's my email if you want to email me uh, privately or ask some questions we can have some private discussions as well um, so yeah okay so this is uh, uh, Kanasa 
uh, and this is the myth of Urubu Hei, which means um, King Vulture. And uh, uh, the world was living in the darkness back then. And the only source of energy was a firefly in the hand of Kanasa. And because it was so precious, he kept this firefly in his hand all the time. So he was the only one with this fire firefly um, in his hand. And, but his people pressed him and said, uh, try to create a bigger light, but he didn't know how, right? And at some point, he, uh, he starts to draw uh, what is the figure of a stingray in the sand, but he could not finish it. Um, and so it did not materialize. So there are some meanings as well in the fact that someone draws and that there is a link between drawing and the materialization of, of reality, which is particularly interesting. So he talks to another bird. Uh, who was passing nearby, a sarakura, and he asked, can you please lend me your light? I cannot draw, it's too dark. And sarakura re uh, reveal to, to, reveals to, to our hero Kanasa that the urubuhe, the king vulture has, is the only one who has the fire. So he had to find a strategy to uh, attract the urubuhe. And finally, Kanasa, Somehow, magically, he manages to draw a deer, the, 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 the figure of a, a deer. This deer uh, materializes itself and Kanasa hides inside of this deer. And uh, it, it, it is very vivid and in, in this sense, like it, the story brings some sort of uh, the sensual aspect of this deer in, in sense of it is a carcass and is stinking. And this stench will attract the urubuhei. So Kanasa uh, uh, hides inside of the deer and waits. And all of a sudden, the Urubuhe appears, this magical creature with two heads and these beautiful colors that, uh, in my opinion, they remind uh, us uh, on the, the, the colors of the flame burning. And I don't think that that's exactly random, as I'm going to explain later. So this figure with two heads appear and um, Kanasa manages to catch him by his foot and steals the fire. At some point, Urubuhei was not really uh, happy about being captured, uh, and so decide to, he decides to teach the, uh, the, the Kanasa and the Kuikudos how to make fire uh, uh, instead of like keep on uh, capturing him. So, and he, uh, um, the, the, the Urubuhe decides to, to tell them which type of wood to choose, uh, uh, how to make fire by friction, and what sort of uh, oily nut uh, will be used to uh, aid the, uh, the creation of fire, the, the spark of fire. So what can we know? Uh, so this, this, uh, um, this picture shows uh, the plant of Urukum, uh, uh, which is a, a very famous plant in the Amazon and the, the indigenous people use it either to protect their skin, it's like that red tint that you can see uh, somehow in, in the pictures uh, and uh, it protects from the mosquitoes but it also uh, is used in the, in the culinary and is also used uh, again uh, as we know, as we all know now, to create fire. Um, so the interesting part of uh, of uh, of this story and how it links to energy and how it links to the, the broader discussion is the fact that while the uh, Greek mythology and the, the you know the, the myth of Prometheus uh, is mostly associated with the metaphysical uh, you know uh, aspects of uh, existence, so fire as rationality, fire as intellect, uh, and a creative spark and. Uh, uh, the indigenous uh, literature and oral um, narratives instead, uh, they, they are kind of like more tangible and um, they, they depict a reality in which mythical and magical creatures uh, link and bond with more practical uh, elements of reality. If you think about the Urukum nut, if you think about also uh, the symbolism of uh, the deer, which has always been um, depicted as transition, and fertility, but also a very practical side of the carcass, because the carcass is emitting gases, and the gases, as we know, are part of uh, the element that produces energy, um, uh, together with the biomass and the, the leaves and, and uh, all the elements that you can find in nature. 
so uh, the Greek mythology, the, the, sorry, this indigenous mythology is very much linked to uh, some uh, elements that are practical and they tell us a story about how people interact with energy, how people make sense of energy and how uh, they, 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 they translate uh, how they find these links with nature and how they use elements that are available in nature. And of course, the magical elements, they help people to narrate this story across the generations. It's easier to remember if something is magical, creative and colorful like the Urubuhei, right? So um, it is very much vivid today. And my hypothesis and my point here is the fact that we need to uh, draw from these narratives, we need to draw from these mythical stories to understand the culture, to understand their worldview. Uh, um, the, the, this, I'm not, of course, the, the only one who's, who did this. Also, Brazilian uh, literary, uh, Brazilian authors started to do this at the very um, beginning of the 19th century. They uh, capture the essence of. Uh, the, the, the indigenous worldview, especially in the metamorphosis and shape shifting. Uh, for example, I'd like to share um, some some reflections on how uh, also the, the the Brazilian anthropologist Eduardo Vivero de Castro uh, recounts that in the worldview of indigenous people, everything is shape shifting, and people transforms into tree that transforms into animals and vice versa. Therefore, if things happen in different times, you're surrounded by people. The tree is not a tree per se, is, is a person. And therefore, that knowledge might change the way that you interact with the elements of nature as people, as community, not as objects. So this is very much opposed to our worldview and uh, our current worldview and our current philosophy entrenched into the uh, economic system of using things and throwing them away. Um, so in conclusion, what, we, what can we learn from the indigenous ontology and the application to energy? Perhaps we can learn from literature and indigenous oral stories uh, that uh, we have a, a nature grounded basis for energy production. And perhaps if we listen to this uh, oral stories and if we get a knowledge of, uh, if we also decode them because of course we need anthropologists and we need indigenous people and we need indigenous uh, uh, scholars who help us decode this, uh, the, the symbolism of certain uh, elements of, the, of this narration of course. Therefore if we take into account this very valuable uh, worldview and point of view, we can co-create or we can not only learn how people interact with energy and maybe gather, translate this into our culture, but also how to deliver sustainable energy for all in a way that is more in tune with their cultural system without uh, delivering even the, the, the greatest renewable and the smartest renewable. But if that's alien for them, as we've seen, it might be disruptive rather than, you know, helpful. So uh, with these reflections, I, I leave you and uh, please uh, send me some questions if you're interested and, uh, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Antonella. That's really fascinating. Please, if, if people have questions or comments, do pop them in the chat pane because now we're going to be picking up um, what has been put in the chat pane and, and I'll be fielding the questions to David and Antonella so we can uh, respond to the thoughts that you've been thinking about as you've heard each of us speak. Um, to kick us off, though, um, I would like to ask the question, um, how can we use classic literature and indigenous folklore to help us in the energy transition that we need to do now? What, what, can, we, what can we do? David and Antonella, could you comment on that? David first. Well, I think that um, energy is in itself is morally neutral, but um, insofar as human uses of energy are concerned, it, they become moral dilemmas in, in literature. And it's literature that seems to focus on these moral dile dilemmas, even when there's no theological element. So that um, you find uh, in writers like Zola or uh, Ibsen um, or Chekhov, uh, a concern with the environment which is not 
theological, but which is nevertheless um, uh, deeply disturbed by the destruction of the environment and uh, in many cases by the gap between the rich and the poor. The, the, these are fundamental issues in literature, especially since the uh, Industrial Revolution. I bring a more practical side of uh, literature instead. Uh, literature is used as a way, uh, as an expression of people's worldview in a more abstract way, but also in a more practical way. So, um, in my view, uh, we find in indigenous literature some elements of reality that uh, tell us how people interact with energy and what can we learn from it as a, as a, as a culture, but also uh, th they send us some, some, some elements that perhaps we can co-create some energy systems together with uh, indigenous people, in, rather than just uh, talking about participation in a more like uh, broader way, but in reality, we are still bringing our technology and our worldview and our, our philosophy, our Western philosophy. I, I use literature in, in, in this sense to gather an understanding of the worldview and I cannot do it on my own. I need uh, indigenous people to help me to debunk this. So energy as a cultural production, uh, sorry, um, indigenous stories and oral mythologies and folklore all tell me uh, a story about energy and uh, it's 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 our task to decode that and transform it into practical solutions okay so i'm going to be super practical now <laughs> being more scientific background um uh, to say that well I can really see the merit of using literature and narrative and other arts, drama, et cetera, to, to help people see different perspectives. And, and I'm, what I'm picking up from both of you is that without being exposed to these different perspectives or, or, or using the power of narratives to be able to see from someone else's point of view or a different culture's point of view, then only by doing that will we be able to um, be effective in tackling the, the, the you know the greatest um, challenge that we currently face which is climate change and then changing our energy forms um, yeah. I mean in a way it's also fair to bring in uh, other worldviews perspectives rather than you know just having a dominant one and I think it's also morally right uh, correct to, to, to bring in different voices Indeed. Uh, and if, I, if I may just uh, point out that in, in literature the, the practical side if you want to sum it up would yes. be to um, in, engage in, in a political process uh, and in economic processes by which those who are most disadvantaged in the world uh, would be given due attention so that they wouldn't be victims of transformations in energy as in the case of the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's great. Um, and I'm going to pick up a comment, um, a question or comment in, in the chat pane that, that um, picks up on this and basically saying that some of the technologies that I showed in my presentation are then they're not, nothing to do with energy equality, which is the goal of which we would all agree is, is morally correct. But it's, it's more about um, the rich West continuing our lifestyle. You know, we, we want to have personal vehicles we want to be able to fly and so basically we're just using technology and uh, to switch the energy form so we can carry on but that doesn't mean we're being energy necessarily being energy efficient and it's certainly not um, enabling everybody to reach the same level so is that a moral question that can be served by literature can we can we use literature to, to shift the narrative away from business as usual um, and to, to make it focus more on inequality, environmental damage and help everybody and say in the, in the, in the West, realize energy equality for all? Yeah, if I may intervene, uh, I, I, I've seen an interesting video this morning. Um, the, um, the purpose of literature is to create empathy, is to give you an experience of the other so is to have an experience of what the other is experiencing. Therefore, we'll create empathy. Therefore, it can speak to a more global understanding of just replying to what you say, basically. Uh, yeah, so it has, literature has a psychological effect, which cannot be uh, neglected, you know. 
David, would you like to comment on that? Well, uh, 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 just to give a, an illustration of a work of literature that, that did have a very uh, uh, profound effect um, in, in America, um, the, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, the factories were, um, they, they tended to have very poor conditions. Uh, there were long hours and they were, they were really a, 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 a health and safety risk, almost all of them. And in Chicago, um, the novelist Upton Sinclair wrote a book exposing the, um, the corruption in, in, the, um, in the factories. And within a few, within a few weeks, the Americans passed the Food and Drug Act because he made it clear that these conditions could not continue. And it, it, because it was a novel and it was a story, it was fiction, but nevertheless it was, as Antonella said, it created such a degree of empathy with the characters that the, the Congress felt they had to do something. Well, that's an extreme case, but I think that generally literature is very involved, is very engaged, and uh, seeks to effect change. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, uh, I was uh, reading some comments like uh, that literature is a waste of time. It's considered nowadays something that you read uh, on the beach when you go on vacation. Uh, but in reality, it's a, um, a time machine because it can give you so many experiences uh, that actually you're living multiple lives in your own life. And you read uh, the, the story of, uh, you know, women and uh, all the sorts of adventures and you live uh, those stories with them and, and all the, the, yeah, life stories and something to be, you know, learned from us. So it's not a lo loss of time at all. We actually, it's a travel machine, actually. Yes, yes. <laughs> It's a, it's a time machine, but also maybe, I don't know what the word is, but not, not shifting back in time, but also shifting between different people who you might never have met or conversed with or understood the background. And yes, the, the power of reading, particularly something fictional and in, which is engaging, does, does really help in understanding the context of the time. But, but it, it takes us back to our own time. It's a time machine where we go back and, and we... we find the insights that we can use for today. And so at every stage in literature, there are things to be relearned. Absolutely. Okay, then in which case I'm going to pick you up, David, on, on something you just mentioned about the, the passing of, of a law um, against um, um, the, the factory practices at the time. I mean, that was in that particular country, but we see unsafe um, factory practices elsewhere in the world now, uh, yes. producing garments and shoes and whatever it is um, at the lowest cost possible to sometimes the, um, the, the causing the death of the people who work in those places. So what can we, what can literature do now is, can it still be relevant in, in having such an influence in, in changing the culture? Well, um... I think that in any free society, um, that it, it, the effect of change is going to be felt more strongly uh, than in societies where writers are suppressed. Um, uh, there, there was a, a case a couple of years ago uh, where uh, Ibsen's Enemy of the People was performed in China. And... Um, and it, it describes a case where in a spa time, a spa town where uh, the, the economy depends upon the, the, um, the waters where people come and they take, you know, they take a cure. And it's discovered by the local doctor that the uh, waters are polluted. And uh, so the question arises, do we announce it that it's dangerous? in which case uh, our economy is, is in trouble, uh, or do we hush it up? And this play was performed in China, and the audiences um, did not see it as a description of Norway in the late 19th century. They, they saw it as something happening 
in China now. And so they began to shout out uh, slogans uh, and, and they created disturbances. They began to protest and consequently the play had to be taken off. Um, and I don't think it has been performed since then. But as you can see, um, uh, it has a, literature can have an enormous emotional uh, impact. Yeah. Well, if you think about the dictatorships, um, I'm Italian and uh, I've, al I've always heard stories of how Mussolini shut down theaters and, um, and all the, when the Nazi burnt books, uh, it's all about suppressing another worldview, another opinion or, or a descendant voice. Uh, which can be learned uh, through books and through literature. So literature is, is incredibly powerful and often neglected, especially yes. in uh, energy studies, I think. Either it's neglected or suppressed. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking David <laughs> play actually when I heard the pubs. You can go on forever on that. <laughs> yeah. well, we, we are now running out of time, but can we just close by asking David Antonella to say, to say if they know of any work of literature which has affected the environmental narrative since Silent Spring was published by Rachel Carson. Do you know of anything? Me, you obviously, you can't think of something immediately, so then there's a, there's a gap there. Uh, we need someone to come up with a, a tome, a narrative, a, a piece of fiction that obviously can help us all um, move on. Um, I'm going to close it there because we've run out of time. Um, but thank you everybody who has joined us for this webinar. I hope you found it interesting. It's certainly a, a novel topic for me anyway. Um, and please can you just give a wave or a clap to say thank you to our speakers, David, Antonella and myself. And um, I hope you uh, are interested in some of our other webinars as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.